see, now we can get busted saying things. So are you <laughs> got it wow don't have to be really close <laughs> Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to today's panel. Um, my name is Dr. Haifa Mamar. I am the Executive Director of Emerging Technologies at Full Sail University. And um, today, actually, uh, we're streaming live, um, uh, it looks like it. And welcome to everyone here um, uh, with us. Uh, so I would be the moderator of the panel. Uh, and we would be talking about artificial intelligence and its impact on the film industry. I am not in the film industry, but I am in the emerging tech industry, so I speak everything technology. And I have this amazing uh, panel uh, panelists with me today, uh, all from Full Sail University. Um, welcome, guys. So we have Rob Sloan, Dr. Rebecca Lees, and Randy Baker with us. Um, so let's start sure. and talk about this. Okay, so first question, I would please ask you to introduce yourself mm -hmm. uh, to everyone in the audience, and if you can get closer to the mic, because it looks like they cannot hear us very well. Oh, it's hard? Okay. All right, um, my name is Rob Sloan. I'm a course director in the graduate film program, uh, mostly teaching post-production, a lot of digital workflow properties, this, that, and the other, visual effects, all kinds of fun stuff. Can you uh, hear my us now, Vera? Yes? Okay. Fantastic. My name is Dr. Rebecca Lees. I am the program director over some of our computer science programs, and um, I'm here to talk a little bit more about the AI components. And my name is Randy Baker. I'm a course director for composition and visual design in the digital cinematography bachelor's degree program at Full Sail. So we teach students how to become filmmakers. Well, thank you guys for being with us today. Um, so. Since last year, we've been having this artificial intelligence revolution. It's impacting all fields. It's creating lots of excitement, especially for us in technology. And it's creating excitement and kind of, um, um, I would not say fear, but maybe people are just um, curious about how is AI going to impact their field. Um, but today, we're talking about the film industry. So we'll be more going into details about where is AI used uh, in the film industry? How does it impact any kind of creative process? Um, I mean, I can tell you from now that AI is not going to replace uh, any jobs or humans. Uh, it's just a matter of us um, being um, understanding how to use it and so on, and then we'll be talking about the future of, of film, of the film industry. But before we go into that, uh, I wanted us first to explain what is AI, what are the different um, subsets of AI, and uh, uh, Dr. Lees, I will look at you here because you are our um, uh, expert uh, in the AI field in the emerging tech. So let's talk about that from the emerging tech perspective. And then uh, Rob will look at you and Randy to talk about it from the film industry mm -hmm. perspective. So perfect. OK, so um, AI, uh, it can mean a couple of different things. So. Uh, we have what we call weak or narrow AI, and then we have what we call strong or general AI. And uh, what a lot of people think of when they 
uh, hear the term AI, they think of strong or general AI. And you can kind of think of this as like data from Star Trek. Uh, he can do a lot of things, right? Um, he can cook you an omelet, he can drive a ship, he can do whatever um, you ask him to do. So he can do a lot of different things, whereas a weak or narrow AI is going to be doing one particular type of task or a grouping of tasks. So you can think of this as like a self-driving car or um, you know something like your home assistant. Um, I'm not gonna say their names because I typically activate them when I talk about them. <laughs> um, but something like a, a, an echo, right? So you can talk to them and they will respond to you in a particular way, but they can't cook you an omelet. Um, so a lot of people think of more strong AI, but there's actually smaller components to it. And AI essentially, when we kind of like dive deeper into the definition, it's just essentially mimicking some kind of human behavior. Uh, so we can start thinking about smaller components, and then as we build out AI tools, we'll have to start thinking about interoperability and how they all meld together in order to move towards that general AI, because we're not, we're not there with the general AI. We've done a lot of narrow AI at this point, though. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Rebecca, if you can also explain the difference with AI, machine learning, sure. and maybe data science, and how is all of that related? And then we'll go into the film industry so that it can be a good transition for them. Perfect. OK, so um, AI is kind of like an overarching topic. And machine learning is a subcomponent within AI, where the, uh, essentially we use algorithms in order to be able to make sure that the machines are learning in a particular way. So are things like reinforcement learning, um, supervised learning, unsupervised learning. Uh, supervised learning is kind of like learning from a mentor or a teacher. You have somebody there to guide you. The human is there to guide the AI and what that data means. Unsupervised learning means we kind of just throw the data at the AI and say, hey, make sense of it. Um, reinforcement learning essentially is just kind of like practice over time, very similar to how humans learn. Um, practice makes permanent. So reinforcement learning is just rerunning the same algorithm over and over and over again for the AI to be able to learn from that particular grouping of data. Um, and then within that, there's also data science. Data science is kind of like to the side, but it also includes some AI, it includes some machine learning. Um, data science also includes some like more traditional statistical models. Um, but it's, a, it's another component related to AI, and we use a lot of data in order to inform AI models. So they're related, but not quite the same. Okay, so Rob, go ahead. Yeah, How there, are we using AI in the film right there's now? A, there's a ton of different like names that are just applied to, to kind of everything, but what's kind of interesting is even though 2023 kicked off this massive sort of revolution and AI is gonna take over everywhere and all these cool images and videos are being made, uh, we've actually been using a lot of artificial intelligence mechanisms for many, many years, um, largely because we're constantly trying to manipulate images. So how can we go about manipulating those images? Uh, so some of the basic stuff, uh, going back to even the, the film era, we used to actually have to create little little stencils. They're called articulate mats in order to do visual effects, to, to separate the layers of something like a green screen shot versus what the foreground would actually be. Well, over the years, we would actually use uh, something more akin to like the Photoshop tool that has like magic, the magic wand kind of technique, and it became a lot more streamlined. Well, that's a very simplified algorithmic form of, of what we're now using for object detection, or we're using something like a depth map where it's able to perceive what the distance in the image actually is. And that allows us to dramatically speed up the way that we do composite imagery for visual effects purposes. So. Things like object detection, um, masking of, of imagery has dramatically increased the, the value of uh, computational systems within the, the visual effects realm in particular, which overall reduces budgets, which overall allows more people to do the fun creative things instead of a lot of the, the tedious kind of stuff. Um, the one that gets a lot of hype though is the, that term generative AI. Um, which it comes in a multitude of different forms, but the ones that come up mostly with filmmaking, you hear kind of like um, the, the GPT variations, or large language models, where they're just kind of spitting out a bunch of words based off of some sort of prompt. Uh, you have the, the direct single 2D image versions. Um, and then you also have some that are, it, it's motion video, short clips, you know, a few seconds at a time, um, but you have generative video. All of these are, inference applications where it's basically taking this understood machine learned amalgamation of data and it determines what things go together 
and then it tries to make an assumption of what what it thinks, like what the computer thinks you're actually asking for, um, which is why whenever you ask it the same prompt over and over again, you get a bunch of different kinds of stuff that sort of looks the same. Um, so that's that's kind of where the the industry kind of sits right now. Filmmakers everywhere are trying to figure out how to use it. Uh, the studios are absolutely trying to figure out how to use it. Not necessarily to the way that a lot of people think they are, but um, it's it's definitely in active research in many, many different institutions. John, did you have anything to add there? Sure. So for, <clears throat> for us, most of my students are looking at generative AI, and that's, you know, uh, large language models, also small language models. You probably haven't heard much about small language models, but not everybody wants all their data up on the cloud. So if you, if you want to be more concise with, and what a language model is, is a bunch of data points that they put together, and they scrape information to get all that data. And so that's one of the ethical issues going on right now. There's basically a, you know, money laundering going on with data right now in the industry. I would people... be talking about all the ethical issues that <laughs> yeah, you yeah. So, but but for filmmaking, we look at it. You know, what what's happening is like Rob said. There's a lot of you know stuff out there that we've been using for a while that has AI built into it. Especially if you look at companies like Adobe and you know things like that uh, and Microsoft. And there's just a lot of that out there. But you know, you also have to look at beyond generative AI. The big buzz right now in video, obviously, is you know text to video generators or multinodal to video generators, and they're they're going to become known is, you know, idea to video generators down the road here is what you're going to look at. But you also have to look at things like, you know, bots and uh, uh, agents. Mm -hmm. AI agents are going to become really, really important in filmmaking coming down where you have a specific AI agent doing specific tasks for you. And so we use it throughout filmmaking right now, and but everybody is trying to figure out, okay, how do we do this? How do we use it? But we, we use AI constantly in pre-production and pre-vis and, you know, research and, and production and post-production and even in distribution uh, as well. So, Randy, you're talking about uh, using AI bots um, uh, in pre-production um, and post-production as well. Can you elaborate more on that? What sure. kind of specific tasks? For me, in <clears throat> project technologies, one, one simple thing is, as you said, it's a repetitive task, would be scheduling. Instead of having a human being there to schedule people, then the AI can do that for you. And um, so you, you can free that person to do other things. Uh, but I, I would love to hear from you what other tasks can be used. Sure. So, you know, AI is a tool. It's a technology tool. And you have to think about it as a technology tool. It's just like the computer when the computer first came out. So, for example, I had a student come to me about six months ago and he said, I want to do a documentary that's based on arts. You know, and I said, okay, so do you have any ideas of what you want to do? And he goes, oh, not really. So we used ChatGPT to go out and say, okay, you know, typed in and said, what are some, you know, great uh, documentary ideas for doing documentaries about the arts? And it gave us like a giant list of these things. And then he said, well, you know, how do I get the money to do this? And I typed in, okay, what are the funding sources out there for arts-based documentaries? And it gave us like a huge list of those. So he used that to go out and develop his idea and then go out and find funding for that. So that's the research part of it alone. We use it all the time for pre-production, pre-vis. Uh, if you haven't seen any of the films like uh, the Galactic Menagerie or things like that that are out there, lots of AI films out there already. People are using these as previs, and it's not only changing really for us as filmmaking, but if you look at the advertising industry, my gosh, that's going to be one of the big areas that it's going to change dramatically. So you'll see it being used throughout everything, and of course, you know, I've uh, I have a, a script that I recently did. Um, that I wasn't really excited about writing the script. I just got to be honest about that. It was kind of a boring topic. Um, and so what I did is I took all the information from the pre-production pre meetings I had with the clients and I typed it into a chat GPT and said, write a 10 minute script on this. And it spit out this 10 minute script. And I said, okay, cut that down to an eight minute script. And it did that. And I said, okay, make it with a narrator only. And it did that. And I said, make it with a on-camera talent as the voice. And it did that. And I said, break it down into three separate smaller segments. And it did that. All of that took me about an hour. And then when I gave that to the client, he was like, oh, my God, how much how time did you spend working on this? And <laughs> yes. I was like, about an hour. <laughs> and how long does it usually take? Oh, that would take days, if not weeks, to okay. do all that research. So I like that you uh, talking specifically about this example because 
yes, we're giving this to the AI, but there is a whole human, or you were after the AI correcting what you need. So there is an intervention from the human. You're not just taking the output or the outcome that AI has given you and just delivering that. You're reviewing everything, changing other stuff, kind of like even um, um, switching some of the dialogue or probably the uh, narrative or, or I mean, uh, I'm not in the film industry, right. so probably I'm going to butcher this. But you're switching the whole idea to uh, get it the way you want it. So you're not just taking everything. And the way always we're talking about AI is just um, there is no human intervention. It's going to replace our job. Uh, again, I, I want to like kind of um, stress on this specifically. Do you think, agree with that? think about it instead of artificial intelligence, of enhanced intelligence. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it's a tool. So, and what you're going to find is that it's brainstorming intelligence. Yeah. Like it's getting you right. started somewhere, it, and then it kind of you refine that. The great that. thing about yeah. generative AI right now is it gets rid of all the boring work that you need to do. You know, mm -hmm. and that's that's what's going to happen. We'll talk about that when we talk about how it's going to affect jobs. Yeah. But you know, the boring stuff that you know, ten to twenty percent of all jobs have these boring parts to it that people don't want to do. Let AI do that. You know, that's the that's the key to AI. Mm -hmm. Anyone wants to add? Go ahead. Beth. Yeah, I was gonna say for um, artificial intelligence, really the important part about humans um, being in the loop is that we're here to evaluate what the AI has produced. Essentially, there are things that um, happen sometimes called hallucinations, where <laughs> if you utilize something like ChatGPT, it will confidently give you the wrong answer sometimes. Uh, and you might not necessarily know that unless you have the background and the education, the jargon that um, a lot of people get when they're in you know, school in order to be able to evaluate that process. And that's one of the things we've done as a university is having to change our assignments so that we can accommodate for the use of generative AI in order to decrease the time that it takes to do a particular task, but also allows the students to still exercise those things that they've learned in an in a, uh, active and meaningful way. So, for example, the script that I did, I didn't just give the, t the client the AI-generated scripts. I went through the scripts myself and exactly. changed a ton exactly. of stuff. Exactly. So you always have to have human interaction with yeah. it at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the research, the brainstorming side of it, the, the ideation, a, a lot of that is, is how most of these, the institutions that are trying to implement it, like this is where they're kind of starting from. Um, and a lot of people can go to, to one of the sort of the open platforms, just type in a prompt and get an answer, um, uh, kind of like what Randy was describing. But the, the institutions that are actually putting this to work are taking it to the, to the next level mm -hmm. because you ha that's just kind of like a, a generalized knowledge, right? Whatever the data set was from whatever date that it was all compiled, that's what it's working from. But when you have uh, companies that are, are basically saying, you know what, we have a pretty consistent uh, branding language. We have a very consistent you know, color palette and the way that we go about writing the things for our brands. Why don't we take all of the deliverables that we've had for the last, I don't know, three or four decades, we'll throw all of that together into one particular data set and we can more specifically train based off of this data set that is specific to us yeah. so that now when we're starting to get questions and we want to throw prompts out there, it fits that particular subset of information to make it more accurate. So this is one of the areas where a lot of the writers were freaking out. This is an area where a lot of the actors were kind of freaking out because if you can feed a data set of material that you own the IP for, how can that be replicated? So That's a small language model. That's what we talk about when we talk about small language models. It's training the AI about mm -hmm. something specific. Um, so I mean, now we're talking about the AI and how uh, it's helping uh, mm -hmm. in the filmmaking industry in the whole process, whether it's pre-production, uh, uh, post-production, uh, I, I mean, even marketing, everything, and every aspect uh, of the filmmaking, uh, the AI can have some kind of um, um, intervention there or help there. Um, but let's talk about the challenges. Yes, AI is good, and it's helping you in all these tasks and all these processes. But um, we also know there are some big challenges that filmmakers are currently facing when they are integrating AI tools uh, specifically in their workflow. So can you guys share a bit about that? The biggest one that, that I hear pushback on constantly is, is always related to the IP aspect. It's, it's always the legal, the legal standard. Uh, because when you start working with large brands where you know, they have money and people know that they have money, as soon as you start to 
use AI in those tools, the, the copyright and the trademark and the, all the different IP components start coming into play. Can you actually use it? Um, right now with the copyright office, they say there's no copyright that, that can actually be applied to anything that's actually generated in that capacity. Um, so there, it's the, where does the source of the information come from is, is the big question mark. If it's entirely held within within house, kind of like the example that I was providing of your, you know your own data that you're sort of filling it in with, you tend to have fewer and fewer issues there. But you're also then limited by you can only work with people in house. It's much more difficult to kind of mm. spread the knowledge, which is what making these things a little bit more open uh, has has afforded things to do. So the IP tends to be the biggest challenge. Um, if you're if you're going to use sort of a, a generalized method, um, whether that's that's imagery or whether that's text. You have to consider that everyone else, everyone else is able to effectively recreate what it is that you're doing. Um, the the other side of the the generative is is this actually up to the quality that we go to expect? Which is why it can be used for previs, but as soon as you say it's going to be used in production, everyone's just like, no. It, mm -hmm. Like we know that people don't typically have six fingers. We know that eyes don't go in all these different kind of like different directions. The color consistency between characters, like it, all of those things are, there's still problems. Even though a lot of them have kind of been like solved, there's still problems in the way that they can be implemented. So it's very early days of this technology, um, but those are the those are the two that I keep hearing about. Uh, the other ones that I'm hearing about kind of related are um, governance. So um, how is the government being uh, included in these conversations? And a lot of times, like with technology, what we see, regardless of the type of technology, is the technology comes first and then the governance comes later. Um, so the governance has to catch up. Um, and a lot of times that is based off of um, real world examples of like, Okay, well, you know, we've struggled here. How can we improve moving forward? Um, so we, we're going to talk a lot about like ethical considerations. Um, but like, what happens when somebody takes the likeness of somebody else without their permission? That's yeah. that's going to be included in that conversation. Um, the other thing too is we were talking a little bit about the quality. <laughs> there are times where you know there are six fingers. There are you know weird. Uh, direction of eyes and um, there was an example I was looking at actually last night where uh, there was a woman walking and the walking kind of looked like skipping at points so it's like they're they're not super smooth movements the fine motor things um, can often be a little bit uh, clunky um, you know if you really kind of pay attention sometimes the background it doesn't act the way that you would expect it to for like a an extra or you know a background actor um, so those are things that that might pop up the other thing too is that you know we have to keep that human in the loop in order to make sure that those things are getting fixed in the production process so like I said earlier uh, like chat GPT can give you hallucinations um, some of the large language models can give you hallucinations so just double checking um, particularly any kind of like statistical or um, reference based information uh, because sometimes if you ask it to prove how it knows that particular thing it will give you a fake reference um, they've done some really awesome stuff related to fixing those types of things so now it won't provide you specific references um, but some of the tools you have to just be double uh, you have to double check and make sure that you're using them in an um, ethical and an appropriate way. So what we're talking about here is a very micro look at filmmaking and AI, you know, but you have to look at the broader picture, and that includes finance and government and ethical considerations and, you know, military, and, you know, there's, there's so many different things. Uh, the finance is, like, amazing. The, you, this is unprecedented, the amount of money being thrown to AI right now. There's things like the AI chipsets, you know. The, there's a chip war going on right now that you may not be aware of that. But it's international, and there's all kinds of implications about China and Russia versus the United States, and so that, and then the governance part of that. Mm -hmm. Do we want to govern heavily and safeguard this, uh, or do we, if we do that, the concern is that, okay, we're quashing that and we're going to be outpaced by other countries who are not doing that. And then there's the, uh, you know, uh, it's just so many different layers in this. You know, what good can it do and what bad can it do? We've seen the bad already, you know. You, we've had, you know, people go out and scrape data off the internet thinking that their, you know, uh, chat GPT was going to be great and within 48 hours they had to take it down because it was saying all kinds of weird stuff and mm -hmm. trying to get the person to divorce their wife and marry them and, you know. So so that, that kind of stuff happens. So you got to be very, very, very careful. But it's a, it's a broad-based approach to AI that you need to be looking at, not only just filmmaking. Uh, thank, thank you. you. So I was going to add the, um, 
some of the examples is uh, essentially um, if you the like the way I like to talk about it is if you teach um, AI bad things, it's going to say bad things. It's like teaching a toddler. Um, so a lot of people, when they first start out with AI, they want to kind of see like what is the capability, what is the boundary. So they start feeding it some pretty um, interesting things, and the AI learns from that, and it uses that as like the base, and it says, okay, this is the thing that it wants me to do, and it continues to do that thing. Um, so we want to teach it good things in order to make sure that it does good things. Um, the other thing that kind of pops up sometimes with um, AI uh, components is that because the tools can only do a certain limited amount of things, a lot of times you need to use a, a set of tools in order to be able to do a full AI production from start to finish. So there are certain tools that do things like um, uh, cut out the fluff words, the extra words, the ums, the uhs, the likes. There are certain tools that will uh, help you write scripts. There are certain tools that, that will do color corrections, but not one tool does all of the things. So um, when you start to think about that, uh, there are some pre options, but if you start to get into a more professional capacity, like how many tools do you need in order to actually do a full production from start to finish? The cost of AI is really important too. That's one of the things that nobody talks about, but if you're gonna do AI, you're gonna spend some money. You know, it's, it's not cheap. Uh, you know, I'd probably have $2,000 a year right now in AI programs that I'm using, paying monthly fees for that yeah. stuff. Yeah. I agree with that. And also, when we're talking about AI, one main challenge is the bias. Mm -hmm. It depends on AI, uh, what kind of data set you fed them. Yep. You f like, so usually, there's like this was also um, in conversations a lot, is that usually we are really targeting the data set that we're feeding is uh, a man, white man in the 40s and so on. So we're not really representing other groups uh, or women in general. So having uh, that challenge of making sure that your AI, even if your AI is not trained on that group, mm -hmm. it, it's important to make sure that you're training uh, your AI on um, different data sets so that you have the uh, other representations from other groups as well. And that can backfire, which yeah. it did Gemini. recently with Gemini. Mm -hmm. Gem mm -hmm. Gem like they had to pull Gemini off because it they would say, okay, give me a photo of the founding fathers and it would be an Indian and a, a black person and a Hispanic person and a woman and stuff. And they were just trying to be politically correct, mm -hmm. but that wasn't representing what the person was asking for. So there were safeguards in place, yeah. but those safeguards you know, needed to be tweaked a little bit. Okay, so we talked about this current state of AI mm -hmm. um, uh, and how it can be a partner, not mm -hmm. a replacement mm -hmm. of what uh, we're trying to do. But let's talk about the creative process and uh, given everything that um, is happening uh, with AI right now and where we see it in different phases, uh, we can see uh, how do you see AI impacting the audience experience? So now we talked from our perspective from you as producers and filmmakers, but then how about the audience experience of films, um, both in terms of content creation and consumption? How is, how is the receiver using or taking AI or getting impacted by AI? My, my kind of overview of this, and it, it, we'll kind of dive deeper into some of the other questions, but essentially it means there's gonna be more stuff, right? We're gonna have more things to actually watch. Every single technological innovation ever, just look at history, has led to more of something, right? Um, one of the things that we, we constantly have to bring up is the, you know, film used to be actual film. It was plastic. It was a chemical layer of, of plastic, and that's what we shot everything on. It's what we did post-production in. It's what we delivered in. And as soon as we were able to change some of that into a digital capacity, we started getting more. And then we started getting more and more and more and more. And now what, what are what are we stuck dealing with? We're, we're assigned into whichever list of streaming network we're attached to, right? Whatever we're paying every single month. And we're going, there's nothing good on. Because there's never enough. It's not that there's nothing there. It's there's nothing you actually want to watch. The quality. Of the, the well, it's, it's just like what the audience itself is not, their taste is not actually being found. Because yeah. we, mm -hmm. we've had, we've had this ability to, I mean, over time, we've, we've had, 
very kind of homogenous. The culture kind of conforms to liking the same sort of stuff. But now that we have these sort of differentiated personalities and generation after generation, they're more and more diverse in all of these different ways. There's all these different like niche components of what we actually want to watch. And so everyone is interested in all kinds of different stuff, which means we have to create content for all that different kind of stuff. So what AI is going to allow us to do is it's, it's that next sort of creation engine of, of a multitude of different layers within the process that simply allows fewer people to make more stuff. It's not a bad thing from a jobs point because all the people that, that would be stuck on one project can now be split among two, three, four, which means there's more choice for the audience, which means we have more great things to see. Um, it allows for more accessibility to be able to make films at this point. Too. Um, so there are some people out there that would love to get into filmmaking, but they don't have money to, uh, you know, start their own studio. But they can use a lot of these tools in order to be able to start these projects. Um, the other way that I think that uh, consumers are going to be able to interact with AI a little bit more related to filmmaking is that AI can now tell us, um, it suggests things for us, right? So um, a, as far as like marketing and ads and branding, we can utilize AI to be able to make sure that those things are getting in front of the people that we want them to get in front of um, so that they can choose those particular things well, that they wanted. This has been already uh, yeah. before, before, way before AI with uh, Netflix or Hulu mm -hmm. or whatever your stre streaming platform is. When you watch a show, and next time you come you come back, it says, bef because you watch this show, you may like this. Mm -hmm. That's AI. That's learning from your interests and your choices to give you other stuff. Um, but like, yeah, with the audience, I, I, I see it even more than that. So, yeah. it, it's becoming personalized, though, it's is, personalized. is part of the, the benefit, because the, the recommendation engine method that we, we've had for a long time is, is usually based on demographics, right? It's the same demographics that Nielsen takes a look at. is like, these people watch this type of show, which means these are the advertisers you want to go out to. I've had this for a long, long time. But now, because it's it's gone to the granular level of the individual liking certain types of shows and liking different types of niche content together. Now you have a more personalized, like actually your run of the inference is like, this is the recommendation. Um, and one other component to that that I'll, I want to add in is we have this really cool thing where we make our own content in whatever language we speak, right? The biggest difficulty is being able to take that, that individual piece of content that we've made and localize it everywhere. As of right now, the way that that's localized is we go to a, a small subset of the actual dialects of languages that are actually around the world. For instance, if I wanted to take a movie that was shot in English and translated into Spanish, I have two variations of Spanish that I can use. Now, for anyone that knows anything about the Spanish language, there are many, many, <laughs> many different dialects of Spanish. Yeah. It's all driven by slang. It's all driven by the localization that you have there. Well. AI translation tools that have been coming out very, very recently are actually allowing true to form, this is the actor's voice that's encoded in a way that we can actually make them speak whatever the language needs to be with the appropriate localization to that sales territory, what we call countries, um, for what the content needs to be. So now, rather than requiring something to be dubbed or subtitled into, well, now you can actually watch it, we can globalize content very, very rapidly, which exponentially increases the audience, not just, you know, a few other people. True sync, right? I think that's one of them. Uh, it's one of them, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at 11 Labs if you want to see a good example of that. It does 52 different languages, automatically rotoscopes the lips so the lips match between the two different languages. It's amazing technology. But, you know, for me, it's going to open up filmmaking. It's democratizing visual storytelling for everybody. If you want to be a visual storyteller, when I started in the business, it was a million dollars to get into a production company. You had to buy a switcher and the cameras and the tape machines and stuff, a million dollars. In 1980, I wrote an article saying that now anybody with $100,000 can get into the production industry. Today, you won't need that. Still, it's going to cost you. I mean, you're going to have to pay for like Pitka or Midjourney or Sora or whatever you want to use, and it's going to cost you, but it's going to open it up for everybody to tell their stories. And that's, the, for me, the most exciting thing about AI is that everybody is going to be able to tell their story, mm -hmm. and it's going to give us all these unique voices that we don't have right now. And there are some entry points where you can start off with some free tools. Um, they have some freemium tools as well where you can start out with the free version and then go towards a paid version. So like I said before, there's a lot of like 
um, points of accessibility here for various types of filmmakers um, at various levels in their career. Um, so one example is like Hyper. Um, that's a free tool right now. Really um, great. Yeah. And uh, um, Sora hasn't quite come out yet. Uh, they're, they're in beta testing, but um, I, that's going to be, it's open source AI, so it's going to be at least uh, free at first. <laughs> um, but they're, yeah, they're probably going to put it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's going to be a freemium model based off of what they did with ChatGPT. But yeah, mm. there's a lot of really cool tools that you can start out with. Um, the tools that are free typically are lower quality tools, um, but they're a really good starting point. Um, you can do a lot more like cartoonish, stylized type videos, and that way, you can um, avoid some of the issues that you have with like photorealistic generated content. Um, and so we'll probably see a lot more like cartoon esque, anime esque type uh, content coming out a lot more than what we have in the past because of that as well. Thank you. So, um, Randy, you shared with us how you used AI as you're writing the script, as to brainstorm, to find uh, sponsors um, and um, funding and so on uh, for, for whether when you were helping the student or for your own thing. Um, uh, so I, I am not going to ask about specific examples how AI was used in the creative process of it, but because I think we, we share different examples, but I want to go more into the ethical considerations um, uh, that filmmakers really need to think about and take into account when using AI in the creative process of things. And we talked about the IP and so on, but um, let's talk really, let's dive in into the ethical aspect of this whole thing. So there's a lot of ethical as aspects of this. You talked about bias. That's mm -hmm. one of the big things. The ethical aspects of where that information comes from. Uh, you know, but there's a whole list. There's a list of about seven or eight things that most people are looking at uh, in terms of, you know, w w really to be careful of with AI. And so uh, you, you have to really kind of go through, and it's up to both the AI manufacturers, the people who are making this stuff, and the AI users to really police that themselves. So what you have to realize is that this is the infancy mm -hmm. of this. This, you know, ChatGPT, AI has been around for a while. Uh, ChatGPT, which was really the big tipping point for everybody, came out last February, you know, a year ago this last February. Uh, and, you know, really text to video generators and text to you know, graphic generators came out in the fall of last year and really, you know, November, December were really big. And then the big tipping point again was February 15th when Grok was introduced and Jim, Gemini was introduced and Sora was introduced, which overshadowed everything, mm -hmm. you know. And up to that point, you had, you know, filmmaking was like you could create five or six second clips and it was like roll the dice, you, you know, what you typed in, the prompt engineering. If you don't know about prompt engineering, that's what you need to learn, okay. How well you, you wrote that prompt really made a big difference. And so for me, that is where filmmaking comes in. That's what separates filmmakers from any other person using AI to create video because you have to know the craft of filmmaking. You have to know focal length and you have to know lenses and you have to know depth of field and you have to know all that stuff. And if you could type that into your prompts, then you're going to get better looking images out of it. Right now, it's a, it's a roll of the dice, what you get. It's not, you know, it's like Rob was saying, right now, but it's changing so rapidly. I mean, mm. it's changing so rapidly. What, what the thing about Sora was it was video realistic, and you could do up to a minute, and it was video to video. You could edit together different things within Sora and stuff. And so that was what everybody flipped out about. I mean, you know, uh, what's his name in Atlanta said, I'm, I'm canceling my $800,000 studio expansion you know Tyler Perry. yeah Tyler Perry because because he saw Sora and was like oh my god you know that's what it is but again it's still in its infancy I mean if you look at Sora the week after Sora Sora didn't have any audio to it, it was just videos but it, a week after Sora came out emo came out and said mm -hmm. okay we, we can take that video and they took video from Sora and they added voice to it and they made music videos out of it and stuff and then since that time there's been you know, probably 30 or 40 different video generators like Sora that have come out, you know, because it's open AI, you know, mm -hmm. it's open AI. That's the whole point of this. It's open um, and anybody can take that information and use it. So it's, it's, 
it's again, it's it's moving so fast. Rob and I were talking about this, trying to keep up with the technology, extremely mm-hmm. hard. I, I listen to three or four podcasts a day on AI. I read five or six articles a day on AI, and I still don't feel like I'm I'm keeping up. I don't. It's just because it's moving. Yeah, there's so a fast. lot going on. The five major apps are yeah. coming out every day in AI. Five major apps. That's unprecedented. One one of the considerations, because I mean, not everyone here is going to be an independent filmmaker. You may work professionally at a at a facility. Um, one of the kind of the, the ethical considerations from putting any of these tools into production is the fact that they may not be around in six months, a year, whatever. Uh, because, uh, for instance, we, we've been talking about uh, OpenAI's Sora engine. It, it's not out. Um, and the reason it's not out is because it's insanely expensive. The compute costs alone for that are dwarf mm-hmm. anything that has come out before, which is part of what it the reason why it's able to produce the good stuff. It's spending a lot of time in a computer just calculating. Um, so trying to trying to figure out how to, how to put some of that stuff into practice, well, what happens if your tool dis- disappears, right? A, a lot of us are used to, to working with professional media creation tools from very well-known brands, and they've been around for many, many years. And they may not be the most up-to-date all the time. Um, and I have students that lament that <laughs> with me. It's not nearly as fun as this other thing. Why can't I just use like this editing tool that I have on my phone? And I'm like, because I don't know that it'll be here tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So you have to make sure that you're like hang out in the research space of understanding where, like where the pulse of the industry actually is. Um, but don't necessarily dive. My recommendation at least would be to not necessarily dive absolutely head first because it may not be around and a lot of those IP governance, legal, ethical kind of considerations of the the various lawsuits going on may be the reason why some of those tools may no longer be around. Uh, the other thing, too, when considering like what to uh, use AI for and what not to use AI for um, is, you know, essentially, are you is your organization going to allow you to use AI. Um, a lot of times, when you use some of these models, you are essentially putting data out into, mm-hmm. you know, the universe. And sometimes that data should not be out because it's either um, private data, um, maybe like uh, HIPAA protected, FERPA protected, whatever it may be. Um, probably less so for for filmmaking, but for some of the other things that that um, AI is used for. Uh, but sometimes we've had um, case studies where certain companies will utilize the like software developers will utilize tools like this and they will put the code out into this particular tool and the tool actually is not uh, within that particular organization so now their proprietary code is out on the Mm -hmm. internet Um, and so that causes a lot of issues as far as like now can we use that can we trademark or copyright that particular product because now that that uh, code is out onto the the internet the other um, ethical consideration that we need to kind of pay attention to is the data that we're feeding in um, is based off of human data. So we need to look at the human that it is adding that data in, check their bias. We need to look at historically who has been collecting this information, check that whole process to see if there's a bias in that particular process and making sure that Actually, we're Actually, fe- you can use AI to remove yes. that bias you can, there. You can. Yes, saying. you can. You can do some feature engineering. You can look at a whole bunch of different stuff in order to, to see where those things are. There are some like seemingly innocuous and like well-intentioned tools that might still have bias in there because we're all human and we all have bias regardless of whether or not we think we do. Um, so it's really important to kind of take a look at those. Some really awesome books that are related to that are Algorithms of Oppression and Weapons of Math Destruction. <laughs> um, both of those are really great uh, pl- places to be able to kind of look and see what examples have already happened in the real life um, and how we can uh, uh, mitigate those risks as we start to utilize the tools. So let me give you a good example of that, the, the bias and fairness of that. So w- w- this kind of shocked me when I learned it, but, you know, uh, there's a report out there that says if you live uh, farther than 10 miles away from your job, you are more likely to change jobs than if you live closer than 10 miles. Or HR companies know that. You know, if you're an HR 
firm. So HR companies were using that to discriminate against people when they were hiring them and they found out about it and they said wait that's not fair you know you can't do that so you have to kind of look at that you, you also have the privacy concerns that we talked about you mm -hmm. also have transparency and accountability that you need exactly. to be thinking about autonomy and control who's in charge of this mm -hmm. who's controlling it uh, uh, obviously job displacement that we're going to talk about manipulation and misinformation huge you think the <sighs> internet is bad wait till AI jumps into this security risk that you just talked talked about. And of course, for me, one of the big things is unequal access. That's why I keep talking about the cost of AI so much. You know, it's the, it, there's going to be a divide. There's going to be an AI divide, just like there was a computing divide. Thank you. The other thing, too, is um, when you're thinking about both the organization that is creating the AI and the people using the AI, um, it is the organization's responsibility to try to figure out some kind of usage policy. Um, so, for example, Sora has their own usage policy that basically says, hey, don't create violent content, right? Um, don't create X content, don't create Y content, because they don't want to be um, perpetuating those types of things. But then it's on the user to make sure to follow those particular policies. Um, and it's on all of us together to ju just make sure that we um, kind of uh, check in with ourselves, make sure that we're using it in an appropriate way, um, and that we're not creating content that's going to negatively affect uh, the population. Good people well, with high-end technology <laughs> is going to do good things. Yeah. Bad people with high-end technology are going to do bad things. Yeah. So it's a good transition to my next question, because at Wholesale University, we are embracing the AI revolution. We are letting the students uh, use AI to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and because as educators, we know that AI is not going to go anywhere. Um, the same way years ago, we accepted that this is the digital world. We are using emails. Things are changing. We are dealing with another era the same way as um, uh, that era. So we are embracing it. Um, but as filmmakers and educators, um, how do you balance leveraging AI technology to enhance the productivity and the efficiency of what's coming while preserving that uh, authenticity and uniqueness in the product uh, that you're designing? Bex, I know that in emerging technologies, we have our, our own. So yes, at Full Sail, we are embracing AI, but then within the department specifically, we are doing things different. We do embrace it, but at a different stage. So mm -hmm. we start with you in emerging tech, and then we'll go to the... So um, in the earlier programming courses, you can use AI a lot to uh, generate code, right? So um, right now what we're doing in the beginning program portions of the program is we're telling students it is okay to use it in this instance, but not okay to use it in this instance, right? So the okays, we need to make sure that we're very clear about where the gray areas are and where the black and white areas are. So, you know, a good use of generative AI is something like uh, explain quantum computing to me like I'm five years old. Um, that way, it kind of gives you the explanation. Um, it's used as a teaching tool, as a training tool. Um, and it gives you uh, real-time responses based off of the questions that you have as a student. Um, for later on down the line, we actually encourage them to utilize it in a different way. Um, so one of the things that we don't encourage at the beginning is just copying and pasting the, the prompt of whatever the assignment is, putting it into generative AI, and then they copy and paste the exact response back into um, into an assignment. We don't want that to happen. We don't want them to be over-reliant on tools that you might not necessarily have access to once you get into your career. Um, but later on down the line, we want them to kind of like break it and reverse engineer it. Like how can we play around with it? How can we create better prompts? How can we um, improve on the process as we move forward? Um, so we're, we start out with very limited like um, guided use, like putting on bumpers, um, putting on uh, you know like uh, an area for them to go through, and then later on we kind of open it up and say, okay, now play around with it, see what you can do. Um, because we want to build yes. the talent, so mm -hmm. those who are creating those AI tools are the students yes. coming out of emerging tech. Um, Rob, how are you guys leveraging AI? Um, yeah, the 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 reverse the reverse engineering is the is the right way to to kind of apply it because the, what the students need to understand and this this is applied to full sale students from you know when the school first started if you don't understand the base concept if you don't understand the, the thing foundation. that you're actually trying to do it doesn't matter what tool you're actually applying so 
for instance, in, in my class, I, I always kind of go back to this. If you can, if there's something that you're trying to do, if you look back in history to when that concept was also being applied and you can understand the, that, what they're, the way that they accomplished it, apply today's technology to that same old thing. Right. It's the it, it's the reason why the revolution in, in like virtual production kicked off. Like so many people got really excited about that. Um, and so one of the things in, in filmmaking that I'm starting to bring up in, in my classes is in visual effects. One of the things that we're trying to do is recreate physical locations. Right. We have uh, we want to be able to shoot on this particular location, but we got limited by the day. And so now we need to do all this visual effects stuff, but we can't actually like be back in this location. And it's too costly to physically build. Well, in the subset of machine learning for computer vision, there's a, a relatively new technology called a neural radiance field. There's a similar technology called Gaussian splatting. There's another one called sine distance fields. The point of all of these is to take a small handful of different images, and from those images, the algorithm is able to interpret what would be directly in between the two different or three different perspectives that are there. It's called novel view synthesis. What this allows from a visual effects standpoint is to recreate a room like this photorealistically because it's derived from photos in a way that you don't need as much data. This also starts to apply when it comes to, well, I need to do this reshoot of a, of a scene with an actor, right? Because if you can recreate a location, which is hardscaped, whatever, you can also recreate people as long as you have photos of them which is obviously possible. We've seen deep fake technology as, as it applies to, to actors applied for many, many years. Um, Jeff Bridges got to be very young for Tron Legacy. Limitations in quality notwithstanding, he looked real. So we're starting to apply this type of technology today, and it's not all that different from the stuff we used to do, but we're no longer hand modeling it. We're no longer doing necessarily stop motion animation. We're understanding the concepts of why those methods worked and then we're saying, hey, there's this new thing out here that allows you to do something very, very similar. It takes compute, it takes a little bit more engineering understanding, but now you're able to apply this or whatever comes next. So we, we you know, I follow all these educational, you know, blogs and stuff as well as AI blogs and filmmaking blogs. And so, uh, you know, what every school is worried about is people cheating, you know, using generative AI to cheat, you know, that's why. But we have, you know, every school, first of all, must have its own AI policy. You have to have an AI policy about how to use it and what you can do and what you can't do. And that's tied into our ethical policies that we have for every student, you know. And we hold those students, we're very, very, you know, hardcore about that. If you're cheating, we, you, there's severe consequences for that. It's the same thing here. But again, you, you have to kind of use it as a tool uh, it said for for education. Uh, for we're really lucky. We're we're a very high end school that you know embraces technology. I just worked on a Star Wars shoot on our virtual stage using Real Engine, all AI stuff. You know, uh, you know where the camera was, the camera was feeding the computer and it was changing the background based on where the camera moved and everything. So we're we embrace technology quite a bit. And again, that's what you need to do with this. You need to get in front of it. You need to embrace it. You need to use it as a tool. And I say to my students all the time. You wouldn't think about doing a production without your computer, but you know, 20 years ago, well, you didn't have a computer. So, and when the computers came out, people were like, oh, it's gonna ruin filmmaking. It's a, it's, a, it's a tool, it's a technology tool. But you have to really, you know, guide the students. They're students, that's what we're here. We're, to teach, we're here to teach students about how to use this ethically and right, the right way, you know? So we, we as a school, we take it very seriously about being able to lay that foundation for students so when they go out into the real world, which we are a real world school, you know, they know how to use this technology and know how to use it right instead of, you know, taking the, it, it's very easy to take a lazy way out of this and just use AI to think, oh, I'm not gonna do the job. You know, you heard me talk about, well, I didn't wanna write this script, so I used AI. I used it for research. I went back through and rewrote that entire exactly. script myself, used my own voice in that, and so I would never ever just, you know, do something in generative AI and then give it to a client or give it to, you know, hand it in as a homework assignment. You just, you just can't do that, so. I love what you said, Randy. Um, Bex, did you have something to add or you want me to go with the next question? Okay, we're good? Okay. Um, so I love what you said about misconceptions of AI. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, and specifically when it, I mean, 
today we're talking about filmmaking, but it's in every field. Every field we can have the same question and change filmmaking to a different industry and it all applies. Um, but there are some misconceptions when it comes to using AI. Uh, and I want to know more about how are you uh, or how should we educate both the general public and the industry professionals uh, about the capabilities of AI and the limitations of AI so that everyone is kind of really aware of, uh, because you have two kind of opinions at this point. It's either everyone is freaking out and this is uh, creating lots of problems, or like this is so cool, it's changing the whole thing and how things are done. So we need to kind of shed the light on limitations, capabilities, this is where we are, this is what we should do, and this is where the future is going. So uh, I heard a really interesting story recently about a one-legged stool. So before electricity, um, the dynamite manufacturers would have... Randy, can you get closer? Oh. Yeah. So before electricity, dynamite manufacturers would have somebody that they watched the room to make sure the room didn't heat up to get too hot and explode the dynamite. So what they did was they put the person on a one-legged stool so they couldn't fall asleep. If they fell asleep, they fell off the stool and it would wake them up. And so that's, and so that's kind of where it's at right now. You got Again, I, I can't stress this enough. This is, you know, in its infancy, really. ChatGPT was a year ago, February. You know, Sora, which is the big trending thing right now, how it's going to change, you know, video and filmmaking, was February 15th. You know, that's the big day that everybody needs to remember. That was only a couple of months ago. Since that time, all this new technology has come out. I mean, major, major technology that's just as exciting as Sora. You know, so you have to kind of look at it that way. So it's a crystal ball. And so we talk about prompt generators. You know, yeah, you need to know how to type and write prompts. Prompt engineering is a big thing. But, you know, in case you haven't noticed, I'm old. You know, I have been around for a long time. When I started computing, I used DOS. Okay, it was like it was like nice. prompt engineering. It was like prompt engineering. And then the big thing that happened was what? GUI, graphical mm -hmm. user interface. So it's not going to be long, probably within a year and a half or so, you're going to see GUI interfaces for, you know, uh, AI where you're not going to have to write prompts anymore. You're going to be able to drag and drop stuff and and do that. So it's going to change dramatically. And so yeah, all the problems that we're having right now, you know, six fingers or things bumping into or going through things or morphing or third eye or stuff. That, that's all, you know, just a learning phase right now that will, you know, within a year, all that will be taken care of, you know. Uh, but, um, you know, for us, we just have to really look at it as where, you know, you, you almost have to have a crystal ball and say, okay, where's it going to be in a month? Where's it going to be in three months? Where's it going to be in six months? Where's it going to be in a year? And you have to hit for that. You don't have to hit for where it's at right now, you know. That's that's the key to this. You need to be thinking about how am I going to use this in a year because it's going to. I tell my students, I'm ten months into a, a twenty nine month degree program, so they have seventeen months after my class, and I say to them, by the time you graduate, it's going to be a different environment. It's completely you know? different, yeah. Yeah, yeah completely yeah. different. So you need to know that. Uh, kind of going on the GUI interfaces, the graphical user interfaces. Um, the thing that a lot of people don't recognize is that AI has been around for a while. We've talked about it um, quite a bit at this point. Um, and the reason that ChatGPT is so popular and the reason that we're starting to see a lot more use of AI and talking about AI is because ChatGPT made it really easy to use AI tools. Um, the adoption of ChatGPT allowed us to be able to see what we could do, right? And one of the things that's really important as we kind of go through is understanding that all of these tools are just ways for us to translate and communicate with technology. How do we communicate with computers? How do commu computers communicate with us? And so there's various ways of being able to translate that. There's various levels of translation. Um, the way that we communicate is through natural language, but the way that computers communicate is through binary code. And so there's various languages that happen uh, that go through like various levels of those translation processes. And now we're starting to see that because we can use graphical user interfaces that are more intuitive to us as human beings, that we can communicate that information more readily, that we can utilize them without having um, specialized programming technology. But we still need to understand how to 
give it instructions and for it to give us what we want. Um, if you haven't seen, there's a really awesome YouTube video of a dad asking his kids to give him instructions on how to build a PB and J sandwich. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and the and the kids try to be as specific and detailed as possible. But as human beings, we are really good at filling in the blanks. Like that is a strength of ours that is not a strength of computers. So we're starting mm -hmm. to get we're starting to see that translation happen a little bit easier. Um, but for right now, we still have to adjust our prompts. We still have to kind of give it more information. It's kind of like getting somebody who's new and green on, on a, a film set or an, in a project and a having to walk them sh through step by step what you truly want to see from this experience versus just saying, hey, hey, I want to see X, Y, and Z, and then like letting them go and do whatever they want to do. Um, the other thing, too, that's really kind of um, important as far as like the educating not only students but the public is focusing in on um, the underlying theory, we talked a little bit about the foundational information. The foundational theory is not going to change very much over time, um, but the tools are. So we have to kind of focus in on the theory and the foundation in order to make sure that we're building a really good, strong um, underlying component in order to build the tools off of. Then the tools change frequently. Full Sail is unique in the fact that we're accelerated. We start a new class every single month, so we have 12 opportunities to change what we are providing students each year, um, which means that we can iterate and change quite often. Um, the other thing too is that because we're accelerated, we have to utilize tools where students are going to retain that information quickly. Um, and so we use a lot of like project-based learning in order to make sure that they're applying the skills rather than just passively in taking in the information. Um, the other things too is like doing panels like these, making sure that we're going out to the community that we're talking about these things and we're talking about them in terms like in realistic terms, right? Yes, there are some limitations, but there are also some benefits. Yes, it can be scary, but we can work through those scary portions, get through the uncomfortableness and figure out how to mitigate certain risks to make sure that we can use these really awesome, cool tools. So let me just follow up on that. I don't mean to jump in here, but I just, it's very important what you said. And so if you, here's the thing, if you haven't been to Full Sail, I invite you to come out to Full Sail. It will blow you away. It's this high tech school. And if you look at my degree, for example, digital cinematography, every one of our students gets their own high end digital cinematography camera, lighting package, audio package, computer with every piece of software you ever want to use. And though we tout ourselves as this high tech school, what we teach at the basic level is that you, that doesn't do anything for you at all if you don't know the craft of filmmaking, which mm -hmm. has been around for about 120 years. And the same principles and the same information that went into that early filmmaking still exists today. So you have to know the craft of filmmaking. AI is just a now they're one of the many, many technology tools that we've used over the years. Yeah, that's true. And then also we work with industry experts to understand mm -hmm. also the industry so that our students, as uh, Rebecca mentioned, we update our courses regularly. So by the time they graduate, they have uh, the skills that are needed in the industry. So as AI becomes more integrated in the filmmaking process, how do you foresee in it affecting the job market and hmm. the career opportunities? I mean. Everyone is worried about AI. The elephant in the room. Exactly. So <laughs> let's handle the elephant in the room and let's talk about AI stealing your job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, so if we want to be completely honest, there will be some form of displacement. Technology always creates some form of displacement. It's a matter of what is the overall net change and what form that actually takes. Um, there's kind of a harsh, cynical view that basically kind of repeats a lot of like the learn to code sort of mentality, which is not at all right. You don't need to all of a sudden learn how to program in Rust or some other like Python or anything like that in order to be able to use these tools. But what it's going to end up doing is the same thing that happened to the the one legged stool sitter, right? Like they're, they're not needed anymore. They're able to go actually do like actual work instead of just sit around. Um, a lot of the, the things that are being replaced with these tool sets, it, it's a lot of the tedious stuff like rotoscoping work. I don't know how many of you have ever talked to a rotoscope artist. They generally don't like it. It's not fun. <laughs> it's the worst form of coloring inside the lines that you could possibly think of. And it's all day, every day. So if you can replace that type of work and instead you can go into compositing, which is more fun because now you're blending layers of an image, like you're doing creative stuff now instead of the tedium. Um, 
So uh, my largely optimistic view is there will be an overall net gain in the exact same way that there was an overall net gain in, in net gain in uh, filmmaking jobs, careers, different avenues of being able to make content whenever we went from analog to digital, right? Going to digital cinema cameras, whenever we went to online distribution, like everyone's heard of an online influencer now, right? Mm -hmm. That didn't, like there was nothing before that. And so now like granted a lot of, kids in high school want to do that and please don't but <laughs> but that sort of avenue of being able to to get whatever it is that you want to make out to audiences was never there before so it created this mass explosion in in sort of creation um what it what it ultimately creates and i, I find this kind of a just on a theoretical soapbox tangent kind of interesting is that when we all went through the pandemic, we all started to develop a little bit of sort of antisocial behavior. I think a lot of us kind of recognize that. And we don't really communicate with people all that well. Well, now that we've got these AI tools that need to understand what it is that we're trying to communicate, it's almost like it was this gift gifted like uh, like salve to, to basically be able to teach people to communicate better, to be more thorough, to be more conscious of the way that you're conveying things because you're having to tell a computer, which is very dumb, it's capable of doing a lot, but it's, it's dumb on its own, how to do the thing that you're asking it to do. So in, in some sort of weird way, we, we've kind of went full circle in just a, a couple of years of going from we're communicating with people every single day because we see them every single day and we have the water cooler chat and we have the, the smoke break for, for people that go outside. And then there's the cafeteria and like everyone's grabbing lunch together and, and there's the bar after work or, or whatever into we're isolated in our homes only with our, our immediate friends and family for almost two years. And now all of a sudden we're having to get back and talk to people and we're like, thing go there? <laughs> and it's like you don't really know what you're what you're talking about, which is not all that different from being on a film set anyways, because everyone's ideas are already stuck in their head. So it's a matter of like the cinematographer knows exactly what the image is going to be in their mind. But the actor who's trying to work off of a green screen has absolutely no idea what anyone's talking about because they're looking at a green wall. Well, the ability to communicate all of this messaging, which we're learning to do within, you know, prompt engineering, all this and the other. It's just forcing human beings to communicate better which allows for better social interaction. I, I just find that fascinating as a little kind of main thing. Kind of to summarize everything that you said, and I love how you uh, explained it, but <laughs> the AI is not going to steal your job. No. But someone who knows how to use an AI tool can actually replace it, you. In the exact same way that the, the word processor, to some extent, displaced people who had to write things by hand, but net, then you had everyone that was able to do basic word processing and, and data entry. Like, a data entry just became a job. And it was it used to be analog, but now it's, like, it's just, it just changes. Yeah. It evolves. Yeah, I was going to say it. Evolution of jobs is what we're going to see, not replacement. Right, I agree. You know, they, they, there was just a big international uh, AI conference, and they said... 60% of jobs in emerging nations will be affected by AI. Affected, okay, not replaced. Some, sure, some jobs will be replaced, but other jobs will be created to take those places. Uh, and, you know, it's like the coal mining industry versus, you know, renewable energy. That's it. But Rob said two very important things. Number one, it gets rid of all the tedious, boring work. 20 to 30% of every job has boring work. And if you're like me, you know, uh, that uh, that drives me up a wall. And then the other thing is communication. We're a communication industry, but oftentimes we're the worst communicators out there. So it helps us communicate better. So if you want to get a really interesting look at this, go out and look at AI job boards. You probably don't know that those things existed, but there are lots of AI job boards out there. And look, especially for filmmakers, look at the AI jobs that are being created that didn't exist a year ago. So again, it's, it's creating new jobs that didn't exist, and it's replacing old jobs that are primarily tedious or boring jobs like data entry or you know, uh, customer service, you know, where you, you still have to have some human interaction in that, but it's, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna be this over catastrophe where all these jobs are gonna be eliminated. The other thing that's really um, interesting that we do as a university is um, we utilize job boards 
methods and we scrape web data in order to make sure that we're teaching the things that are being asked of from those particular job postings. Um, so one of the things that we do is we like to use the techniques that we're teaching. And one of the AI tools that you can utilize right now is natural language processing. So we can web scrape job postings, see what topics are most discussed, and then prioritize the topics that we teach based off of what is being asked of within those uh, job postings. Or if you know where you find articles or open source journal articles, whatever it may be, how are they being applied in the field? How often is a particular topic being talked about? And then we can iterate over those 12 months um, each year, adding more and more of the, a particular tool or a particular theoretical um, foundational piece of information based off of whatever the, the job posting says and is asking for or that we're applying within the field. So that tool that Rebecca is talking about, she wrote that tool uh, for us in Emerging Technologies. And um, let me just add one more thing. Full Sail is kind of like a family, okay? We're, we're this big family, and it's like a really cool place to work at and stuff. And so everybody interacts with each other, and we teach each other different things. Yeah. I meet with our uh, a career development people, two different people, every month. And I sit down and I have conversations with them about here's how to here's the new tools for AI that you can use to help our students get jobs or here's the new types of jobs coming out. That's so right. we That's really right. are communicating back and forth very well doing that. You can also use AI to help you in your job process as well. So you can ask AI tools to help you write a resume or a cover letter for a particular position. Um, and see if it, you know, you can feed in your current resume and ask it to give you feedback. Um, you know, eliminate half of the stuff on here because I want more white space or um, add in information based off of this particular job posting so that it's more related specifically to the points listed in the job posting. You can use a lot of that for, for job uh, discovery and um, trying to find a new job. Prompts, how do I make myself stand out against yeah. all the other graduates? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're running out of time. I'm going to skip many questions, and I'm going to just ask a question about where are we going uh, mm. with AI? Now we have AI and uh, everything that's happening in the film industry. Um, where do you think the what is what is the future of film? <laughs> Um, it's a loaded question. Right? It, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it is mostly going to be, I mean, I've kind of touched on it, there's going to just be more. I think that there's going to be more audience-specific type content. I, I think we're still going to have the, the movie theater blockbuster kind of style, um, but I think we've all kind of noticed that it takes a lot to kind of drive people out to get the, the little niche films that you, that you end up going to see, the ones from the kind of the mid-majors. Genre films still have their, their kind of popcorn nature. You're able to turn your brain off. You just kind of watch, you know, Keanu Reeves just go nuts, and it's it's fun. Um, but he's only going to do that so long, so there's going to need to be some some derivative that, that comes from that. But we've seen this kind of dissemination of content moving into streaming sort of methods because that allows you to get the big data aspect understood. And quite frankly, that's where honestly where a lot of the, the streaming networks originated when they started producing original content. House of Cards came about because Netflix looked, looked at the nature of big data and they saw that people watching Netflix really liked David Fincher movies. They really liked Kevin Spacey at the time. Um, and they really <laughs> liked uh, political thrillers. And so they're like House of Cards. There's this concept. This is really fantastic. I'm going to green light two seasons. First original content show. And now we've got everything that we've got. So I, I think there's going to be this, this drive towards making smaller projects because, because it's going to take fewer people and because you're able to use these very efficient tools into making stories to, to very specific audiences that are now no longer, as I was talking about earlier, language specific. Because people like certain types of stories in all kinds of geographic regions over the world. The, the issue is the whole Tower of Babel problem. And so now that we can actually cover that, that language barrier, we can now get people that are interested in horror films wherever they are, or um, comedy, which is typically very regionally specific, can now be tailored to a little bit more of a, of a wider audience that you're only able to get through um, sort of a recommendation engine. Like it's just, it's gonna facilitate getting the right piece of content to the right audience member from a, from a holistic view. Um, I think kind of going back to the point of like, it's going to make it more accessible. So we're going to see more content. We're going to see different kinds of content. This stuff now allows like 
uh, kids and teenagers to be able to make their own content. And there's not a lot of content out there from that particular viewpoint. Um, they might be, uh, you know, there's might be content out there, but it's kind of also done from an adult viewpoint, uh, remembering what their experiences were as a kid. Um, but there's not a lot of kids out there giving out their content. Um, it's a, in in this particular instance, there's a lot of like YouTube, and that makes sense. Um, but we're going to probably see a lot in different types of content. It allows a lot of different types of people to be able to have their um, voice heard and give their story out. So I, I keep going back to the crystal ball kind of thing. You know, it's uh, if you it's it's such a new technology that right now if you look at the big boys like Microsoft and IBM and Xerox and Meta and all those guys, for the most part, they've been sitting out on the fringes waiting to see what's going on. They're developing their own models. You know, Apple's a good example of that. Apple was so far behind. They dumped their you know, self-driving car and took all that money and dumped it into AI. Now they've got their own AI chip manufacturing. They've got their own internal uh, uh, LLM going on there. And you're going to see the new I, uh, the OS 18 that comes out being heavily laden in, in AI. So it, it's, it's going to change dramatically, especially when you see these big companies go, oh, we can get it, we should get into the video aspect of this because it's such a hot topic because people learn much quicker by looking at video. And you see that already happening. You know, in December, Adobe released a hundred different AI apps, you know, uh, and just yesterday they announced that they're including generative AI in Premiere Pro now. Uh, so those are the big companies that are saying, hey, we are the leaders in this right now, Sony, uh, Adobe, uh, you know, you just you just look at a Microsoft, um, you know, and what they're going to do is they're going to develop these platforms that are going to be all in one video generators. There's some of those out there right now that you can do that, but they're expensive and they're not very good. Um, you know, Vidgen and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but but you're going to see you're going to see these big companies go. Oh, there's a market here for this. So instead of having to go out, it's called in, in post production. It's called round tripping, where you do your uh, production and then you go into one program and edit. Then you go into another program and do your audio and you do another color correcting in another program. So instead of doing that, you keep everybody in the same program, and that's where all these companies are going to go. So you're going to see these big manufacturers jump in heavily over the next year. They're investing hundreds of billions of dollars into this stuff, and they're going to come out with these new products that a year from now are going to be going, okay, you want to do a video? Use Adobe, or you use Microsoft to do this. And it's, it's you're going to see companies emerge that were not in the video industry before that all of a sudden are going to see the money in that and go, hey, we need to get in this, and this is the beginning level of this, so we need to scooch in there now. So it, it's going to change radically. It's it, it's uh, it's uh, for me. That's extremely exciting. Thank you, Randy. And I want to make sure that I leave some time for um, uh, people um, either online or here to ask questions. Um, so we have the mic. Just raise your hand. Hi. So for me, I used my first computer forty years ago, um, whereas government for had it technology for 100 years or more. With AI, how does that apply? Similarly, it's just coming out now for everybody or government had it before? Or? There are a variety of tools that are that are out completely, completely free. I mean, quite frankly, Google is in fact an AI. It's, it's a statistical model itself. Uh, so you can use that as a means of being able to search as many people do for what, what the free tools are. There's a, there's a handful of them out there from a, a few different companies. Um, you don't have to be a techno wizard of any kind in order to be able to, to do this. And that's, and that's for all the different generation, generational methods, be it text, um, be it images, or even some of, the, some of the video items. There's some that you can even download directly on your phone. So what I would say do is for any of those that you're exploring, try the free ones before, mm -hmm. you know. That's not my question. I mean, the technology we started using, uh -huh. uh, actual PC computer right. 40 years ago, whereas governments have had it before, right? 100 years or so. So the AI yeah. existed a long time yeah. ago. This is not a new technology. It's just that now what's happening with the revolution of AI is that it's becoming accessible. We have mm -hmm. a company now that is making it accessible to everyone, making it easy for people to understand. But AI has been here since the 60s, 
so it's, it, it's used in games, in video mm. games, it's used in simulation, it's used in so many different, uh, different yeah. industries. But now with AI and now why we're seeing more people using AI in different industries, it's because it's becoming easy to use. Yeah. It's not that black box that everyone is like, oh, AI, it's scary. We know it's an artificial intelligence, it's some kind of computer. It's, it's, it's we don't have speed. that hype there. Yeah, with yeah. the GUI systems we were talking about earlier, that's what makes it easier. It's more usable. It's easier to use. But there's also a level of like trust that has to happen as well. Um, some of these things have happened have been around. So, for example, video phones have actually been around since like the 70s, but mm -hmm. we just didn't have the um, ability to mass produce them. So now it's cheaper to produce certain things. Um, but then it's also a level of trust. Like we as a population have to build trust with a particular type of technology in order to make sure that we can adopt it over time. So those are some of the, the factors as to why like it existed before, but now we're actually seeing like the boom happen. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Oh. Hi, I just wanted to uh, get your opinion on one aspect of it that, of uh, the AI and film that we all hear a lot about, which is the videos part and the uh, likelihood that there will be a proliferation of misinformation because of the access. Mm -hmm. And are you hearing any, I mean, film has been used for propaganda for many decades, but in terms of the individual uh, ability to access it now and to make deep fake films and all those types of things, which I assume we're gonna see a lot, we're gonna see a lot more of. Is there any discussion about um, where this is all going? Yeah, so um, there's some policies, like we were talking about Sora's um, policy before. One of the things that they are very concerned about is misinformation. So one of the things that they're building into their tools are essentially like watermarks that are gonna be under the film to make sure that it's easily detectable that that film is created from AI versus somebody actually filming that particular thing and having that the true actor or the true t politician or whoever it is there and speaking the words that you're hearing. Um, so there are some instances where that's happening right now and we haven't really been able to monitor it well, um, but they're also recognizing that that's a, a, an issue. And so we can utilize tools in order to one, detect misinformation um, that has been previously sent out already. Um, we use algorithms just to kind of figure out what is true and what is not true. We can do that utilizing the information within the video already. But now we're adding in extra tools to make it even easier to figure out what is misinformation and what is auto-generated or AI-generated versus what is really truly filmed. The cool Go ahead, Ryan. I was going to say, the, the human ingenuity is, is actually quite fantastic because we've, we've actually already seen uh, in the most recent political campaign here in this country artificial intelligent deep fake content being used in the the primary it was immediately detected it was immediately lambasted and it, quite frankly the the campaign never really recovered from that particular use case of it um, individuals that are able to to put this out sort of on their own right everyone can try to be their own little Lenny Riefenstahl and just you know do horrible things on the internet but it's being detected in in a shockingly fast sort of speed because now that we all know that these things exist, that misinformation and <clears throat> intentionally manipulating people, like that's, that's being done on a rapid scale, like exponentially, we're also much more aware of it and we're countering it quite fast. So the policy stuff can be great, but it's, it's also something that the general awareness it's getting it's getting hit back very quickly on on X now. Um, you're you're seeing the little tags go on the posts themselves. This is manipulated. This is completely fake. It'll hit in Google searches. It'll be on YouTube videos. It'll be like everywhere that this stuff is sort of popping up. It's almost immediately getting flagged, saying this is fake or it's misrepresenting these other details. And that's that's the just the mass human condition of I don't want to be lied to. Okay. And so we're, we are able to counter that uh, quite, quite effectively thus far. Here's the beauty of AI. There was just a big report that came out that said generative AI actually will help reduce misinformation. You know, So you're going to see that being used more and more. And again, the thing about AI is if you want to you know, make that happen, you just program an agent to go out there and say, get rid of all the you know, misinformation on that. I wish some of the you know social media sites would be jumping into that as well right now. Yeah, and okay. then the other thing too is just educating 
um, the community to make sure that they can recognize before maybe you know uh, an AI might flag it. Most of the time, the AIs will flag it before we see it. But if for some reason it gets through, also just communicating to the community what is what does fake look like? What does misinformation mm -hmm. look like? Um, what are the typical strategies that people use in order to disseminate misinformation so that it's easily detectable? Um, and just making sure that you're thinking critically about the information that you're intaking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? We're going to take one last question, please. I used to think being a writer was important until I came here. <laughs> uh, if you wrote, if, if let's say you wrote one of these screenplays with chat, mm -hmm. who would know that you wrote it so that you couldn't copyright it? Open AI. Yeah. The, the the tool the tool that you submitted it through that processed out the information, they're the only people that would know. Uh, well, yeah. and, and that's they, accessible, actually. That information is accessible, so everyone would know. Yeah, yeah. so they have detection tools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some detection tools are better than others. Uh, but one of the things that's really important is we will look not only for the content, but um, we actually have internal tools that we use for the computer science program where it looks at things like um, uh, how often they're pushing their project to their repository, which is where they house the, the particular project. How long are they spending on a particular project? Those types of things, so that we can detect whether or not they're utilizing um, AI in an inappropriate way. So you can still utilize the tools, and it will help the process, it will shorten the process, but you still need that human in the loop in order to make sure that you are utilizing it in an appropriate way. The bottom line is you would know, yeah. and that's the important part here. You know, ethical aspect of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being with us here today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, friends, for thank sharing you. your insights and expertise with everyone. Uh, feel free to come and talk to our panels if you have more questions. Have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.